All right, praise God. Good to see you again. And we got through, we're into this third section of chapter two of the Jewish War. And uh, so, what, what are we going to see in this? We're going to see where King Agrippa, the brother of Bernice and Drusilla, who we see in the Bible, that he is going to send um, ambassadors for peace, but they kill his ambassador. So it doesn't work out really well. And so the, those things that Agrippa warned them about, they're about to head into. And of course, Jesus and the apostles warned about this ahead of time also. So they got plenty of warning, but they continued their rebellion. And then we're going to see this thing where Cestius, remember he was the Roman in charge from Syria, and he had that 12th Roman legion that... He's at Jerusalem, just about to take it where he could stop the rebellion, and unexpectedly, he leaves. Wow, so amazingly, so even Josephus is like, man, this thing must have been coming by God to have this happen in such a way that this could not be stopped. And then finally, to where we will see where those priests in Jerusalem appoint Josephus, he's a Jewish Pharisee, they appoint him as governor and a general in Galilee. And so, of course, now even Josephus thought it was ridiculous to fight, but Josephus is a, a loyal Jew here in this book of the Jewish War. Now, Antiquities was written later, and that's where you see things about Jesus and James. And so, it's even possible that. Josephus, and especially after getting these 62 letters from Agrippa and understanding th things some more and seeing how God was bringing this thing about, he could have had an even change of heart. Now, another thing I like about Josephus is I think he is an amazing um, general. Where I've watched some documentaries, and most of the documentaries say he's not a good general. Man, if you look at the things that Josephus was able to do as a general, and even Titus and Vespasian commend him for his abilities in fighting them, which I think was pretty amazing. So uh, let's uh, jump into it. Jewish War, Book 2, Chapter 19, Section 1. Cestius to Antipatris and Lydda, he burned cities and villages, Jews to Jerusalem to Feast of Tabernacles. And then Section 2. The Jews, when they saw that the war was approaching to their metropolis, they left the feast and betook themselves to their arms. And taking courage greatly from their multitude, they went in a sudden and disorderly manner to fight with a great noise and without any consideration had of the rest of the seventh day, although the Sabbath was the day to which they had the greatest regard, but that rage which made them forget the religious observations of the Sabbath made them too hard for their enemies in the fight. With such violence, therefore, did they fall upon the Romans as to break into their ranks and to march through the midst of them, making a great slaughter as they went, insomuch that unless the horsemen and such part of the footmen as were not yet tired in their action had wheeled around and secured the part of the army which was not yet broken, Cestius with his whole army had been in danger However, 515 of the Romans were slain, of which number 400 were footmen and the rest horsemen, while the Jews lost only 22, of whom the most valiant were the kinsmen of Monobazus, king of Adiabene, and their names were Monobazus and Canidius. And next to them were Niger of Perea and Silas of Babylon, who had deserted from King Agrippa to the Jews. For he had formerly served his army. When the front of the Jewish army had been cut off, the Jews retired into the city. But still Simon, the son of Giora, fell upon the backs of the Romans as they were ascending up Beth Huron, and put the hindmost of the army into disorder, and carried off many of the beasts that carried the weapons of war, and led Shem into the city. But as Cestius tarried there three days, the Jews seized upon the elevated parts of the city and set watches at the entrance into the city and appeared openly resolved not to rest when once the Romans should begin to march. 
Agrippa observed that even the affairs of the Romans were likely to be in danger, while such an immense multitude of their enemies had seized upon the mountains around about. He determined to try what the Jews would agree to by words, as thinking that he should either persuade them all to desist from fighting, or, however, that he should cause the sober part of them to separate themselves from the opposite party. So he sent Borsius and Phoebus, the persons of his party that were the best known to them, and promised them that Cestius should give them his right hand to secure them of the Romans entire forgiveness of what they had done amiss, if they would throw away their arms and come over to them. But the seditious, fearing lest the whole multitude in hopes of security to themselves should go over to Agrippa, resolved immediately to fall upon and kill the ambassadors. Accordingly, they slew Phoebus before he said a word. But Borcius, he was only wounded, and so prevented his fate by flying away. And when the people were very angry at this, they had the seditious beaten with stones and clubs and drove them before them into the city. So this is where we see in section 4 that Cestius in Jerusalem, he could have put an end to the Jewish war, but he was diverted. Cestius, observing that the disturbances that were begun among the Jews afforded him a proper opportunity to attack them, took his whole army along with him and put the Jews to flight and persuaded them to Jerusalem. Then he pitched his camp upon the elevation called Scopus, or Watchtower, which was distant seven furlongs from the city. Yet did not he assault them in three days' time, out of expectation that those within might perhaps yield a little. And in the meantime he set out a great many of his soldiers into neighboring villages to seize upon their corn. And on the fourth day, which was the thirtieth of the month, when he had put his army in array, he brought it into the city. Now for the people they were kept under by the seditious, but the seditious themselves were greatly affrighted at the good order of the Romans and retired from the suburbs and retreated into the inner part of the city and into the temple. But when Cestius was come into the city, he set the part called Bethsaida, which is called Sinopolis, or the new city, on fire, as he did also to the timber market, after which he came into the upper city and pitched his camp over against the royal palace. And had he but at this very time attempted to get within the walls by force, he had won the city presently, and the war had been put an end to at once. But Tyrannius Priscius, the muster master of the army, and a great number of the officers of the horse had been corrupted by Florus and diverted him from that his attempt. And that was the occasion that this war lasted so very long, and thereby the Jews were involved in such incurable calamities. So chapter 19, section 5, this is where Annas, he invites Cestius to come into the city, but Cestius is hesitant about this. And then those seditious Jews inside Jerusalem in there, in that temple area, they oust, they throw Annas and his guys down and drive them to the cities. So let's see what it says in section 5. Many of the principal men of the city were persuaded by Annas, the son of Jonathan, and invited Cestius into the city, and were about to open the gates for him, but he overlooked this offer, partly out of his anger at the Jews, but partly because he did not thoroughly believe that they were in earnest. Whence it was that he delayed the matter so long that the seditious perceived the treachery, and threw Ananus and those of his party down from the wall, and pelting them with stones, drove them into their houses. But they stood themselves at a proper distance in the towns, and threw their darts at those that were getting over the wall. Thus did the Romans make their attack against the wall for five days, but to no purpose. But on the next day Cestius took a great many of his choicest men, and with them the archers, and attempted to break into the temple at the northern quarter of it. But the Jews beat them off from the cloisters and repulsed them several times when they were gotten near to the wall, till at length the multitude of the darts cut them off and made them retire. But the first rank of the Romans rested their shields upon the wall, and so did those that were behind them, and the like did those that were still more backward, and guarded themselves with what they call tesudo, the back of a tortoise upon which the darts that were thrown fell and slided off without doing them any harm. So the soldiers undermined the wall without being themselves hurt and got all things ready for setting fire to the gate of the temple. 
Now this next section six, this is an interesting uh, look how Josephus was seeing this thing basically being prepared by God. Uh, so let's take a look at that. So here we see the seditious Jews feared and other Jews wanted Cestius to enter. And then Josephus owes that it was the aversion God had at the city and the temple that the war was not ended in that day. A horrible fear seized upon the seditious insomuch that many of them ran out of the city as though it were to be taken immediately. But the people upon this took courage and where the wicked part of the city gave ground, thither did they come in order to set open the gates and to admit Cestius and their benefactors, who, had he but continued the siege a little longer, had certainly taken the city. But it was, I suppose, owing to the aversion God had already at the city and the sanctuary that he was hindered from putting an end to the war that very day. Cestius was not conscious either how the besieged despaired of success, nor how courageous the people were for him. And so he recalled his soldiers from the place, and by despairing of any expectation of taking it, without having received any disgrace, he retired from the city without any reason in the world. So, wow, amazing. So without any reason in the world, he's pulling off where he could have taken it and it could have ended. But obviously God did not want that siege ending because God obviously wanted Jerusalem taken down and he wanted that temple taken down because Jesus had erected another temple. You in Christ, precious stones built up as a temple of God. So even the Romans were so taken by Jerusalem and the temple and many of the women of course were uh, turning to Judaism even of the Romans so God did not want even them taken by this but he wanted that true sacrifice the Lamb of God as a sacrifice that was a real sacrifice that didn't have to be done over and over with the shedding of blood over and over again but once for all so praise God isn't that awesome what God had planned. So those continuing to look at a political Israel are looking in the wrong direction where Jesus, Peter, Paul, John, James, Phoebe, Mary, many Marys, and all of these people, the woman at the well, the lady drug is a harlot. They're all looking towards heavenly Jerusalem, not the political one. Had they been looking at the political one, it would have been trouble. No. People want their political power. They fight for power. They were doing it then, they're doing it now. But we have one, Jesus Christ. All right, let's continue. Book 2, Chapter 19, Section 7, continuing. So we have Cestius, his unexpected retreat from Jerusalem. He's pursued by seditious Jews, and he's suffering greatly. But when the robbers perceived this unexpected retreat of his, they resumed their courage and ran after the hinder parts of his army and destroyed a considerable number of both their horsemen and footmen. And now Cestius lay all night at the camp which was at Scopus. And as he went off farther the next day, he thereby invited the enemy to follow him, who still fell upon the hindermost and destroyed them. They also fell upon the flank on each side of the army and threw darts upon them obliquely. No durst those that were hindmost turn back upon those that were wounded them behind as imagining that the multitude of those that pursued them was immense. Nor did they venture to drive away those that pressed upon them on each side, because they were heavy with their arms and were afraid of breaking their ranks to pieces, and because they saw the Jews were light and ready for making incursions upon them. And this was the reason why the Romans suffered greatly, without being able to revenge themselves upon their enemies. So they were galled all the way and the ranks were put into disorder, and those that were thus put out of their ranks were slain, among whom were Priscus, the commander of the sixth legion, and Longinus, the tribune, and Emilius, Segundus, the commander of troops of the horsemen. So it was not without difficulty that they got to Gabo, their former camp, and that not without the loss of a great part of their baggage. There it was that Cestius stayed two days, and was in great distress to know what he should do in these circumstances. 
But when on the third day he saw a still much greater number of enemies, and all the part round about him full of Jews, he understood that his delay was to his own detriment, and that if he stayed any longer there, he should have still more enemies upon him. Cestius is being attacked, and Simon of Giora, I put him in the purple there in this picture, you can see that the destruction that was coming on, how there was these three different sections fighting for power amongst themselves. So you got Eliezer, really, he's the one that gets credit for uh, taking uh, Cestius, and then you got Simon hitting him on the rear quarters, and then um, another one we're going to see soon is John of Gishala, another one of those three heads. So you can see all this background coming, and this is even before we see Titus and Vespasian coming on. We haven't even seen them come into action yet. So let's look at chapter 19 of book 2, section 8. That he, Cestius, might fly the faster, gave orders to cast away what might hinder the army's march. So they killed mules and other creatures, excepting those that carried their darts and machines, which they retained for their own use, and this principally because they were afraid lest the Jews should seize upon them. He then made his army march on as far as Beth Haron. Now the Jews did not so much press upon them when they were in large open places, but when they were penned up in their descent through narrow passages, and covered the Roman army with their darts in which circumstances as a footman knew not how to defend themselves, so the danger pressed the horsemen still more. For they were so pelted that they could not march along the road in their ranks, and the ascents were so high that the cavalry were not able to march against the enemy. The precipices also and valleys into which they frequently fell and tumbled down were such on each side of them that there was neither place for their flight nor any contrivances could be thought of for their defenses, till the distress they were at last in was so great that they betook themselves to lamentations and to such mournful cries as men use in the utmost despair. The joyful acclamation of the Jews also, and they encouraged one another, echoed the sounds back again, these last composing a noise of those that at once rejoiced and were in a rage. Indeed, Things were come to such a pass that the Jews had almost taken Cestius's entire army prisoner, had not the night come on, when the Romans fled to Beth Heron, and the Jews seized upon all the places around about them, and watched for their coming out in the morning. Now here Cestius loses 5,680 soldiers and instruments of war. Cestius, despairing of obtaining room for a public march, contrived how he might best run away. When he had selected 400 of the most courageous of his soldiers, he placed them at the strongest of their fortifications and gave order, and when they went up to the morning guard, that they should erect their ensigns, that the Jews might be made to believe that the entire army was there still, while he himself took the rest of the forces with him and marched without any noise, 30 furlongs. But when the Jews perceived in the morning that the camp was empty, they ran upon those 400 who had deluded them and immediately threw their darts at them and slew them, and then pursued after Cestius. But he had already made use of a great part of the night in his flight, and still marched quicker when it was day, insomuch that the soldiers, through the astonishment and fear they were in, left behind them their engines for sieges and for throwing of stones, and a great part of the instruments of war. So the Jews went on pursuing the Romans as far as Antipatris, after which, seeing they could not overtake them, they came back and took the engines and spoiled the dead bodies, and gathered the prey together which the Romans had left behind them, and came back running and singing to the metropolis, while they had themselves lost a few only, but had slain of the Romans 5,300 footmen and 380 horsemen. And now we have 10,000 Jews slaughtered at Damascus in one hour, and women addicted to the Jewish religion. So this is book 2, chapter 20, section 2. The people of Damascus, when they were informed of the destruction of the Romans, set about the slaughter of those Jews that were among them. And as they had them already cooped up together in the place of public exercises, which they had done out of the suspicion they had of them, they thought they should meet with no difficulty in the attempt. Yet did they distrust their own wives, 
which were almost all of them addicted to the Jewish religion, on which account their greatest concern was how they might conceal these things from them. So they came upon the Jews and cut their throats as being in a narrow place, in number 10,000, and all of them unmarred, and this in one hour's time, without anybody to disturb them. Now we have Jewish generals appointed at Jerusalem, and Josephus sets rules of law under his command. But as to those who had pursued after Cestius, when they returned back to Jerusalem, they overbore some of those that favored the Romans by violence, and some of them persuaded by entreaties to join with them, and got together in great numbers in the temple, and appointed a great many generals for the war. Josephus, the son of Matthias, of both the Galilees, Gamala also, which was the strongest city in those parts, was put under his command. He chose seven judges in every city to hear the lesser quarrels, for as to the greater causes and those wherein life and death were concerned, he enjoined they should be brought to him and the seventy elders. And here we have Josephus as general. He provides for safety against the forces. Josephus, when he had settled these rules for determining causes by the law with regard to the people's dealings one with another, betook himself to make provisions for their safety against the external violence. And as he knew Romans would fall upon Galilee, he built walls in proper places about Jatapata, Bersabi, and Salamis. And besides these about Caphereco, Jaffa, and Sigo, and what they call Mount Tabor, Terechi, and Tiberias. Moreover, he built walls about the caves near the lakes of Gennesar in the lower Galilee. The same he did to the places of Upper Galilee, as well as to the rock called the Rock of the Akabari, and to Seph, Jamnath, and Merath, and in Galanitis he fortified Seleucia, Sogain, and Gamala. Those of Sephorus, the only people to whom he gave leave to build their own walls, because he perceived they were rich and wealthy and ready to go to war, without standing in need of any injunctions for that purpose. The case was the same with Geshala, which had a wall built about it by John, the son of Levi. So here, when we're looking at Josephus, this is Josephus that's writing this Jewish history. And then this is John of Geshala. He is one of the three Jewish heads that were fighting for power and ended up destroying Jerusalem and the temple. But with the consent of Josephus, but for the building of the rest of the fortress, he labored together with all the other builders and was present to give all necessary orders for that purpose. He also got together an army out of Galilee of more than 100,000 young men, all of which he armed with the old weapons which he had collected together and prepared for them. Now chapter 21 of book 2, section 1, we have John of Geshala, one of those three heads of robbers, destroying Jerusalem. Okay, this is where John of Geshala is there. Now Josephus was thus engaged in the administration of the affairs of Galilee. There arose a treacherous person, a man of Geshala, the son of Levi, whose name was John. His character was that of a very cunning. For wicked practices he had not his fellow anywhere. Poor at first, and for a long time his wants were a hindrance to him in his wicked designs. A ready liar, very sharp in gaining credit to his fiction, he thought it a point of virtue to delude people, even such as were the dearest to him. A hypocritical pretender, where he had hopes of gain, he spared not the shedding of blood. He encouraged his hopes from mean, wicked tricks, which he was the author of. He had a peculiar knack of thieving. He got companions in his impudent practices. He took care that none of his partners should be easily caught, but chose, as had the strongest constitutions of body and the greatest courage of soul, together with great skill and martial affairs, as he got together a band of 400 men who came principally out of the country of Tyre and were vagabonds that had run away from its villages, and by the means of these he laid waste all Galilee. 
as he supposed that he could once overthrow Josephus, he should himself obtain the government of Galilee. So he gave orders to the robbers that were under his command to be more zealous in their thievish expeditions, that by the rise of many that desired innovations in the country, he might either catch their generals in his snares as he came to the country's assistance and then kill him. Or if he should overlook the robbers, he might accuse him for his negligence to the people of the country. He also spread abroad a report far near that Josephus was delivering up the administration of affairs to the Romans, and many such plots did he lay in order to ruin him. So this is John uh, really fighting against Josephus for power. And then you'll see later this John of Gishala, son of Levi, is fighting against Eliezer and Simon for power within Jerusalem. So that, that was in his evil nature there. All right, let's look at chapter 22, section 1. We see Jerusalem, the sound of the anvil for weapons, and the moderates, they're lamenting, and then omens that we're seeing. In Jerusalem, high priest Artanus, and as many of the men of power as were not in the interest of the Romans, they repaired the walls and made a great many warlike instruments. And in all parts of the city, darts and all sorts of armor were upon the anvil. The multitude of the young men were engaged in exercises without any regularity, and all places were full of tumultuous doings. Yet the moderate sort were unexceedingly sad. Now you got to remember here, Josephus, his dad, his mother, his brother, and others he know are in Jerusalem. Of course, the, the priest that sent him as governor and as general in Galilee. And a great many there were who were out of the prospect they had of the calamities that were coming upon them made great lamentations. There were also such omens observed as were understood to be forerunners of evil by such as loved peace, but were by those that kindled the war interpreted so as to suit their own inclinations. And the very state of the city, even before the Romans came against it, was that of a place doomed to destruction. Ananus's concern was this to lay aside for a while the preparations for the war and to persuade the seditious to consult their own interest and to restrain the madness of those that had the name of zealots. But their violence was too hard for him. Now here we see Simon, the son of Gioras again, that third head of robbers, how he had been tormenting the country. As for the Acherbean region, Simon, the son of Gioras, got a great number of those that were fond of innovations together and betook himself to ravage the country, nor did he only harass the rich men's houses, but tormented their bodies, and appeared openly and beforehand to affect tyranny in his government. And when an army was sent against him by Artanus and the other rulers, he and his band retired to the robbers that were at Masada and stayed there, and plundered the country of Idumea with them, till both Ananus and his other adversaries were slain, until rulers of that country were so afflicted with the multitude of those that were slain, and with the continual ravage of what they had, that they raised an army and put garrisons into the villages to secure them from those insults. And in this state were the affairs of Judea at that time. The distrust among people, the fighting and killing, the injustices where the government was not stepping in with what was just, and those things going on, and the uh, ruling priests were beside themselves. Now the men of uh, knowledge and the moderates were seeing these things as omens against them, where others were seeing the same omens, but they were using it as a reason to continue in their killing, in their plundering, and in their gain for their own power. So even now today, there's probably a lot of people that are seeing uh, a lot of false prophecy. And you got to stick with what Jesus is saying, what the apostles are saying. They warned about the love of many growing cold. It was happening back then at their time. We're seeing that directly. And the same thing happens today. So. Even now, we're, we're supposed to do what's just, even at our own harm. We're even supposed to pray for our enemies and continue in Jesus because He will repay. 
Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. We're not to take vengeance on ourselves. Um, we're supposed to do what's right. That even our enemies, it, if we do what's right, it's even like uh, heaps of coal are put on the enemy's head. Not by us putting it on, but by God himself. They're already stand judged by God, and every man is going to face judgment at the end. Every knee will uh, bow to Jesus Christ because He is just. And He suffered going before us, even going to the cross, to pay for all of our sins. Uh, and we are supposed to pick up our cross and follow Him. And so praise God, we'll continue to do that, be men and women of faith, uh, even young ones in families, to continue faithful because God is good. And we will continue with him. And when we see him come back, he'll say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of the Lord. Well, praise God. I love you. Continue in the joy of the Lord even now. And love God, love others, and do what's righteous by God Almighty. And uh, do good. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.